Well, I'm tired and so weary, but I must go alone till the Lord comes and calls me away. Well, the morning's so bright and the Lamb is light and the night night is as black as the sea there will be peace in the valley for me someday there will be peace in the valley for me oh lord i pray there'll be no sadness no sorrow no trouble i see there will be peace peace in the valley for me well the bear will be gentle and the wolves will be tame and the lion shall lay down by the lamb and all the beasts from the wild shall be led by a child and i'll be changed changed from this creature that i am there will be peace in the valley for me someday there will be peace in the valley for me oh lord i pray there'll be no sadness no sorrow no trouble trouble i see there will be peace peace in the valley for me there'll be no sadness no sorrow no trouble i see there will be peace peace in the valley for me I do appreciate that, Brother Edward. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the service over to uh, Brother Tangway. I have known uh, Brother Mark Tangway. It must be very close to 38 uh, years, somewhere in that ballpark. And um, it's ever since I started the ministry, practically. And Brother Tangway was a member of our church. Um, God uh, didn't call him into the full-time ministry. It's nothing like that. But God did give him a burden to study the subject of creation science um, and uh, I like the idea of a, a, a regular person who has enough passion about something spiritual to study it out and to consider. Now, he did say, you know, that um, my having him come every year, he's told us tonight, he, you know, it makes him study a little bit more, but <laughs> yeah, I don't mind being a kind of a prod for that, too. So, But I do appreciate Brother Tengway, and, and, and I do, I, I very much like the idea of a Christian any Christian, you're a Christian, becoming so interested in a subject that you begin to dig into it and you become, um, uh, you may not care for the word, an expert in that subject. It becomes a passion to you. I appreciate that very much. Brother Tengway, I'm going to let you go ahead and turn the service. I know he's going to kind of, you want some, you want to come up here and start or you want me to help you? You're going to sit up there? All right. You might need to turn on that microphone. Uh, he said he could do it. Oh, you did it? How's that? <laughs> Hands free. No. Uh, so I want you to kind of look at this picture for a minute, though, because I, I am a, more of a preacher than a scientist. But uh, So that's Mount St. Helens, obviously, before it blew, right? How many of you saw it before it blew? Huh. I thought there would be more. <laughs> I don't know why. I just, maybe I'm older than I think, but... Uh, I just, <laughs> Then there's, uh, who knows who that guy is? Tru Harry Truman. Uh, when did he die? What day? May 18th, <laughs> 1980, that's right. 
he died on the mountain. But you know, so there's some things here. One, that looks so peaceful and so pretty, that mountain. If you see it today, it doesn't look anything like that. You know, and, and when I think about Noah and the flood and stuff, they were kind of like that. I mean, they're in this beautiful, beautiful earth. I mean, the earth before the flood, it had the water vapor barrier. It was tropical, North Pole, South Pole, everything. So many plants, you didn't have to work. You just kind of go out and grab something to eat, and it'd be super uh, healthy. And, I mean, stuff everywhere. The temperature is... I remember I lived in the Marshall Islands for a little while. If you got tired and you weren't home, you could just lay down and go to sleep. I mean... You know, and it wasn't a big deal because it's so warm, you don't need blankets or nothing. It's just, it gets to 80 in the day and 75 at night, and it's just, you know, nice. And um, so anyway, they, uh, oh, I guess I can't turn that way. But anyway, uh, and then you think about, uh, you know, they had no idea when Noah was going to said it's going to rain. Had it ever rained before? No, the Bible says a mist came up from the ground and watered the earth. It was so different. And, uh, but Harry Truman, he wouldn't leave the mountain. I forgot how old he was. I think he's like 80 or 90 or something like that. And uh, um, he wouldn't leave the mountain. Why wouldn't he leave the mountain? That was everything he had. He, I don't think he could, he, I don't think he knew what to do if he left. What a sad place to be in. We, I mean, especially if you're hanging on to stuff of this world, to hang on to it so tight, you don't know what to do. But I can also look at it another way, too, because if we hang on to the Lord so tight, then nothing else matters. Amen. So there's all kinds of stuff we can learn here. But uh, um, So I wanted to start here by... Uh, what happened on May 18th because one of the things that they thought they thought the volcanic the Mount St. Helens would erupt like every other volcano just goes straight up in the air that's why so many people died there's a bunch of news guys die if you ever watch some of the stuff like the ridge I was at Johnson Ridge there was a guy standing there thought he was totally safe that's one of the reasons I wanted to go there he's a long ways from the mountain and it blew and he only had a few seconds and he was dead and, uh, and one of the reasons is, instead of the mountain blowing straight up, you see the top picture there? And see the red dotted line? So there's a, as the mountain, it started swelling. And that's how they knew it was going to blow. It swelled like 500 feet. And it started swelling more and more. And, they, and even Harry Truman, they got a video of him. They flew a helicopter down and said, you got to get on the, it's going to blow. I mean, this is imminent now. And he's like, just waving them off, not going. And uh, anyway, what happened is it slid a little bit in the second frame there. And the third one, you can see how it blew out the side. And then later, it did blow straight up. But you see how much material is gone? I mean, that's huge. And if you go up there, you know, I was going to take a picture, but I looked at my camera, and it's just, you look, and then it's like, because you're looking, and the thing is big, and you look in the camera, and it's a little... I don't know why it does that. But even all the pictures and stuff, they don't do it justice at all. I mean, that ridge is so far away from that mountain. It is so huge. And to think that, uh, well, we'll talk about it later, how fast that went and everything. But um, <clears throat> when it blew, there was a guy that was photographing it. And this was like seconds after it blew. And you could see the stuff coming out the front. And that was actually going at uh, supersonic speed. And... They said that it glowed, it was so hot, and it was just it just blew stuff over and scorched. How many of you have seen all the trees that are laid out? They're still laid out like that, I'm surprised. But, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing. I, so it was probably two years after, and I was in the National Guard, and it's different when you fly and you're in the National Guard and you go for a flight. We're just on a C-130, and we're flying over to Wyoming, and because uh, you can go up and sit and talk to the pilots and stuff. It's, Way different. Anyway, he, they're like, and the pilots have a lot of liberty to do whatever they want. Anyway, the guy's in the back, and there's a little hole in the back. He's looking out the window. He goes, wow, there's Mount St. Helens. So I went back there to look. And I was thinking like on a jet liner when the pilot says, you can see Mount St. Helens off to the right. And there's a little thing over there, you know. <laughs> I looked out the window, and uh, we were just like three, 400 feet over the top of the crater. 
and then he banked it like this and went around the crater and I was just like oh man I mean I had no idea it was that big and and you could see the blast thing I didn't really know much about what all had happened but uh, you could see the blast area I was in Astoria at the time and you could see the cloud when it blew and it blew a few times after that and when it blew everybody would come outside and we're all looking is it blowing this way you know because you got covered with ash but uh, and then it ruined your it that was something else but anyway um, one of the things that happened is when that blew the first time it created this pit and it's uh if you look at the mountain it's it's toward that Johnson Ridge area there was this huge pit I could kind of see the outline of it a little bit uh, and it filled in that bottom that's flat it filled in with uh, the ash and stuff for the first day or two and so the pit is like a hundred some feet deep and then you have the ash, which was like 30 feet deep. And uh, <clears throat> oop, I went too far. But then uh, just after that, a few days later, they had a, another eruption where um, a huge amount of mud and ice and everything came down and filled another like 30 feet, 25, 30 feet in that pit. At that time, it's like, you know, it's just filling it in. No big deal. But then on uh, May 19th, 1982, so that's like two years later, so this had time to settle and everything, a large mass of ice uh, from the lake in the lava dome breached, it was called a debris dam, and it breached, and you can see that arrow, it goes down that way, some of it went the other way too, but most of it went that way, and they said it was a hundred foot deep mudslide, so a telephone pole is 30, sometimes 40 feet, so that's like three telephone poles deep mudslide coming down the mountain there and it was going 90 miles an hour so if we had a, a Greyhound bus going everybody was stopped here and a Greyhound bus going 90 miles an hour didn't stop what would happen yeah and so sometimes we got to put that picture in our head because the stuff that can happen with a force that great is unbelievable um, I don't know if you've ever seen the pictures where they get the rioters and they have that that's like 60 mile an hour water coming out of there and it just blows them away but a 100 mile an hour mudslide would just do a lot of damage anyway what happened it hit the canyon filled in the pit but then when it got to the other side it built up and broke through over there and when it broke through a lot of the de mud debris was there and there was just hot water and stuff and it cut through and it made a canyon It made this canyon here. And they call it like the Little Grand Canyon. And what happened, that canyon was formed in like a day of that water running and everything. But what was interesting with that is see up there on the top, oops, I missed a slide somewhere. Oh. Huh. Anyway, uh, a little deal. so this, slot, this area right here, that's the 25 foot of that one slide that went through. And what's amazing is it's got sediment layers in it. That whole thing, 25 foot of sediment layers was made in three hours because we were here. We knew that. It went from nine o'clock to midnight. And so, you know, when they're saying, and this doesn't make sense to me anyway, because they say that these layers are millions of years, but they're nice and straight, you know, I remember in science class, and it wasn't even until I was doing this that I remembered that. And, but this is how, I mean, when you believe something, I mean, my mom and dad told me it's true, and the teachers are telling me it's true, and you just believe it. And I remember him saying about the, si the layers, and so he had this jar, and he put different stuff in the jar, and it had water, and he shook it up and got it going around in circles and set it down, and as it settled, it made layers. And he said, see, that's how they got done. And it took millions of years for each one of these. And that doesn't even make sense to me now. But I mean, I, at that time, I'm just going, uh-huh, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but how could it be uh, in just, you know, it has to be quick. They're so nice and straight. And it looks like it is sediment layers. And here they see it. And so that kind of has been a problem. But I want to just show you some more pictures of this. And the other thing that we get is, so they say in each of the sediment layers is that age you know, and down at the bottom are the little ones, the little plants and stuff. 
And I grew up in Colorado, and uh, there's lots of fossils in Colorado. And uh, they were trying to build this house, and uh, they blew up the area with some dynamite. Anyway, it blew all the rocks out, and it was just rocks. And they said, heck with it, we're not doing it. And so we would go over there and go fossil hunting, and there was like this one thing, it was like a big palm leaf on there. There was all kinds of fish and plant fossils all the time. I mean, I had fossils everywhere in my room. And uh, what was amazing to me that used to almost bother me is because most, almost all the fossils I found were trees that I had, we had in the yard, you know? Uh, and, and it's like, this is, that, that's the tree. But I thought it was supposed to change over, you know, all these years, but there's still, you know, and, and I, it's like, hmm. And then like the fish and stuff, I mean, I used to catch bluegill and perch and stuff. And so I know what they look like. You eat them and skin them and pull the bones out. And I mean, that's bluegill. There's no doubt about it in my mind. And they're saying, well, this is a prehistoric fish. Well, uh, you know, they still got them. I still eat them. And, uh, <laughs> but what amazes me is there's, there's none of those fossils in the bigger fossil layer. It's like, if they were there then and they're there now, how come they're not in the middle? You know, I, I could never, and that, there's a lot of stuff. I'm, I like to, everything has to fit. In fact, if I, I'm a contractor, so if I go to build a house, I actually build it like three times in my head, and then I start. And so I have to have everything fit together. And evolution used to make me so frustrated because you can't fit anything together. And uh, that's why when I started studying creation, I just loved it because you learn this, then you learn that. Oh, that makes sense with that. Oh, now I understand this. And then every time you learn something, it builds on it. The whole thing, you just keep putting pieces in the puzzle together, and you see more and more. And uh, anyway, the, but that would make sense if, if it's like what happened at Mount St. Helens. What animals and plants can't get out of the way? All the trees and leaves, they can't run, right? And the little animals are going to get covered, and the little fish and stuff in the pond. The bigger animals can get away. What about like fossil footprints? I don't know if you know, but on the Plexi River in Glen Rose, Texas, they've got footprints of people running and dinosaurs. That's something else that used to, that got me, is here's all these footprints. And I was goofing around one day and I, so I do my little scale thing with the guy on the computer. He's this tall and so, wow. I mean, it's like these footprints are far apart. And I was thinking, well, the guy would have to be that so big, but that's way bigger than it. And then it's like, oh, duh, he's running, you know? And then I look at the dinosaur ones, they're running. Why is everybody running? <laughs> I know why they're running, yeah. So anyway, what has to happen, if I step in the mud, will it make a fossil footprint? Oh. If an animal dies in the woods out here, does it turn into a fossil? In fact, if you find one that's been dead a long time, sometimes the bones are just almost brittle. Uh, and in fact, I remember I took my kids out one time. We went to uh, Vernonia, and they have a bunch of fossils in the, and it's like ash uh, layer. And there's a bunch of seashells in there. And uh, so anyway, you break them open, and you can break them with your hands. You just break it open, then you find this really cool seashell. But the thing is, because it's in the ash that it's in, the seashell isn't fossilized. So if you touch it, it just goes And I was, it was so tough when my kids were little. I'd, oh, look at this one. Oh, cool. No. Oh. You know, just a minute, let me find another one. <laughs> and so I'm trying to show them like this, you know. But that's because when it gets old like that, it just turns to nothing. When it fossilizes, what happens is it's in the water. The sediment gets on the bottom. It covers in sediment, puts it under pressure. And then the... Uh, like the flesh and stuff a lot of times rots away. And then what happens is the minerals in the sediment go into the bone and replace it. And it becomes petrified or a fossil. Fossils, most fossils are bones. And so, uh, I mean, we're bones, but are rock now. And so anyway, uh, it used to always bug me about that layer thing. And it doesn't even make sense, really, uh, that it could be millions of years. Also, when the, that slide came, it went down on another side, too, and it went through this one canyon. It isn't too big. Uh, it's called Lewitt Canyon. But it went through an area of, of a lava flow that was 500 years old. 
and it just cut the rock. And I've heard people say, well, it can't just cut rock. Well, it did cut rock. I mean, and, you know, it just did it really, really quick. Um, and it makes sense to me now that I'm thinking about, you know, a 100-foot deep mudslide. Uh, when it goes through, there's I mean, nothing left. Like when it went through, I just went on my way up there. I don't know if you've ever seen that A-frame that's buried, the A-frame house. It's, about, it's by the Bigfoot place or something. Anyway, uh, it's up there. I remember seeing it because we went up there right after it happened. And I remember seeing that there. There was like all sediment, the, the ash, and the little peak of a house sticking out. But when it was going through there, it was going fairly slow, like maybe 20, 15, 20 miles an hour. And it was kind of eddying up and stuff. If it was going 90 miles an hour, it's, th that house wouldn't have been there. I mean, it, there's a huge amount of force. Anyway, here's that canyon again, just to kind of give you a different look at it. Uh, that was made in a day. So it was all flat across that. And that's kind of what it looks like today. And I could understand how they think that that little stream might have caused that, eroded it. Uh, but since we were here, we know that that happened in less than a day. It was flat across there, and then that happened. You know, you look at the Grand Canyon, it looks almost identical. And one of the things with the Grand Canyon, uh, if you've ever been around there, it's flat all on the top. It's not, there's no erosion that happens, it's flat. In fact, because I know about creation now, when I drive through that area, you look and you can see, it looks just like, you know, sometimes you go to the beach and there's a rock or something sticking up and how the sand is flat around it. Well, there's little mountain peaks poking up and it's all flat around it. It looks just like that. And then there's this canyon. And so it's, there's no way, in fact, I don't think the evolutionists even believe that it happened over millions of years now. They believe that it happened quickly. The other problem with it happening over a long, that I believe it happened quickly, is where the headwaters of the Colorado River are, there's a mountain range and it goes through the mountain range. If it would have taken a long time, it would have had to go uphill over the top of the mountain and down. Well, water doesn't do that. But what if, and we do know that at one time there was like a huge, I believe it was, so when the uh, flood happened, how long did the flood last? About a year, yeah. And the Bible says that the waters kept coming up for five months and, uh, and then they started receding. <clears throat> I believe it's because the plates hit, anyway, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about the plates in a minute, but uh, <clears throat> when the waters were receding, this whole Salt Lake area, and if you look on a map, you can see the mountain range there. They believe that that was a huge inland sea. And in fact, when you look at, if you drive to Salt Lake, you can see the edge up there. I mean, it's just amazing. Anyway, uh, I believe that was all like an inland sea. Well, and it, it must have cracked right there where the Grand Canyon is, and then that whole sea just rushed out, and it would easily form something like that. And uh, especially if it's within a year. I mean, you know, this that happened at Mount St. Helens was two years later, and it cut through it like it was, even, like it was butter. So um, <clears throat> also in the Grand Canyon, we see faults like this, where layers are laid down, and then they're twisted. What would have to happen to do that? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking earth movement, quakes, of magnitudes we can't imagine to just twist a, uh, some sediment that just got there. I mean, that, that's huge. That's not something that's just going to just happen. And when it gets all dried and everything, it's going to, you would see it cracked and stuff. So that must have been during the time that the sediment was being laid down and everything. Uh, there was huge stuff going on. And this uh, sediment layer that's, that we're looking at, is, it says it's 350 feet thick. Um, but geologists examined the canyon formed in 1982, uh, Lahar. That's what they call that mudslide. I don't usually, you know, when they're talking about all their stuff, sometimes I have to get a dictionary out and look it all up. But anyway, we have to do that when I'm here. No? <laughs> so it says, uh, revealing layered deposits from 1980 and 82 eruptions. It's kind of a, they said it was a 140th scale, but I mean, it looks just like the Grand Canyon with that little crick in the bottom. I want to talk about another thing, this blast that happened. 
when the mountain blew up, that blast that came out went, uh, it was, they said it was supersonic, so that's 700 and some miles an hour. So if Tacoma had blew up and the blast was going at supersonic speed, uh, it'd be what, 15 seconds to get here? Maybe something like that from Tacoma. I mean, that's, that's fast. In fact, I, you know, I remember looking because a lot of the planes, the jets and stuff, when they do the 4th of July thing, and I was in the National Guard, we're trying to plan this thing. And so they said, they sent us a schedule of their flyovers. It said like at uh, 9.58, we're gonna fly over Salem. At uh, 10.03, we'll fly over Newport. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and then we'll be there at 10.04. And I'm like, what? How do you do that? You know, and, and I was talking, and he goes, I guess they go supersonic just a little bit and over. And I mean, when you go that fast, you know, 700, what is it, 750 or something miles an hour, it, it doesn't take long to get somewhere. So that, anyway, uh, that's why that guy, when I was standing there, he's at that mount, he saw the mountain blow, and he only had a few seconds. I think he, he said, oh, was it something about, uh, this is it, or something, I don't know. And then, and uh, there was another guy that was filming. He, I think he's the one that took that one shot of it first blowing up. He thought he was far away. And so the other thing I want you to know is this, it laid down trees flat for 19 miles. So what's that? I don't know. I think Olympia is a little farther than that, but straight. Anyway, I should have looked, but uh, it's about as far as Long Beach to Astoria. You know where Long Beach is. I don't know if that helps you at all. But anyway, so uh, there's just another picture of it. But it's amazing that it just laid these trees down like that. But, oh, wait a minute. But then the other thing is, um, in fact, I want to read that. I got a little part here. It says, uh, and this is uh, off of one of the things from the mountain. It says, a glowing cloud of superheated gas and rocks rock debris blown out of the mountain face moving at nearly supersonic speeds everything within eight miles of the blast was wiped out almost instantly according to the usgs the shock wave rolled over the forest for another 19 miles leveling century-old trees all the trunks neatly aligned to the north beyond this tree down zone the forest remained standing but was seared lifeless the area devastated by the direct blast force covered 230 square miles. That's huge. And uh, especially, you know, when we're looking at that, and I don't know if you remember, but when it blew too, it, it, it affected the climate on the whole earth. Uh, it caused a lot of stuff. <clears throat> but if I was to put Mount St. Helens on that map, see that's supposed to be Africa over there in South America, and this is off that show drain the seas or something I don't know but anyway I believe what happened and the creation view is that the Atlantic Ridge was basically a huge volcano and it blew and uh, it says in, in Genesis the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open so if Mount St. Helens isn't even a dot on that map we wouldn't even be able to see it and that whole thing blew up you know, I used to have this picture of Noah's Ark, and, and he got on the ark, and God shut the door, and then it was seven days, nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, I had this picture that it started raining, and they're like, what's that? And then it starts raining more, and pretty soon it starts flooding a little bit, and they're all knocking on the ark, let me in. And he's, you know, but I was thinking, why didn't they just climb on the ark and sit on the top and, you know. But I don't think that was what was happening at all. If the fountains of the great deep blew up, I don't think it was any five-point earthquake I think it was the scale went and the needle was bent and it was just knocking people down things were blowing up you've got 100 mile an hour winds and mud going this way and that way I think they thought Noah ain't gonna make it either <laughs> and they just ran for their lives and uh, it was bad I, in fact I would bet that probably nobody that was near that made it except for Noah I don't know how close he was either but uh, uh, I'm gonna ask him though and, uh, you know, a lot of times we think about the plates moving and stuff. They say there was water underneath that would have helped. But it's also, we need to realize our planet is molten. You know, it's like a molten lava liquid stuff. 
that's why we have all the hot springs and everything. It's not that far down that it's molten. And uh, that's, that's why volcanoes have lava and stuff. Uh, in fact, they're saying here that the, the core of the earth is 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't, I don't know, I don't know if we can even do that. But anyway, um, but one of the things that, so this guy, uh, Steve um, Austin, uh, he did a whole bunch of research on this. And that's a picture of the, the log rat, the log on the lake there right after. But after a little bit, the log started standing up. And he was wondering about that, so he thought, hmm, so he took a dive down, and there's two things that are happening. One is, well, we'll get over the other one, but the logs started standing straight up, so he went down to see what was happening. And a bunch of them, because when they got blown out, they had the stump part still on them. And uh, the, it would start to get waterlogged and go like this, and then go down and settle. And when he went down, this is kind of what he found. He drew a little picture. So some of the logs were floating like that. Some of them were up and down in the water. And some had gone down and set. And some of them had been there a while. And the layers of sediment, because every time the mountain blew, it put a layer of sediment into Spirit Lake. Uh, they were getting buried pretty good, standing up. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been to the uh, petrified forest in uh, Yellowstone. But it's really similar to that. And so that's a picture. I just got this off the Yellowstone stuff. But uh, I was wondering when I, I used to wonder because I've seen that. And it's just like trees. And what this, the little sign used to say is that this took uh, so many millions of years. Or, and it says 27 layers of sediment. And what they're saying is the trees grew. And then they died and didn't rot for some reason. And then another layer of forest grew and then and the trees never rotted and they got petrified. Which doesn't really make sense to me. But uh, then I looked on their site and they had this picture. This is how they explain it, the evolutionist guys. They say the whole mountain is like that. And what's happening is that it's eroding away and that's why those are on the hill like that. If that whole mountain is like that, what kind of a disaster? What? I mean, that's like, whoa. All of a sudden, you look at that mountain and go, oh my gosh. I mean, it was serious here. And, uh, and it's kind of funny because even coming down Mount St. Hell's today, I was looking, and there's logs laying that are over on the side. They look just like that. Well, if they were to get covered up again, they would look, that's how they would get petrified. And uh, so this Steve Austin guy, he dug around one of the trees like that. And there is no roots growing. If the trees grew there and turned petrified, you would think you'd, the roots would be there. The roots are gone. They're just stumps, just like in Mount St. Helens. I believe that whole thing was like that. And there is a big volcano in uh, Yellowstone. I don't know if it was from that volcano or if it was during the flood when the whole thing was filled. The other thing is coal. Uh, one of the things that he found when he went dove down is he did some samples and stuff. And he found that underneath was like a three-foot layer of bark. When all the trees fell in there and they bumped against each other, they knocked all the bark and stuff off. And the bark went down, and it made this layer, and it got covered up again with silt. And so, but that's how coal is made. You get plant matter. It's funny because I never, I never bought this one because they, they say that it's made out of, uh, like, marsh... Uh, what do they call that? Anyway, it's the peat, and it's kind of a sandy stuff. But if you look at coal, it's not sandy. It's got layers in it. In fact, uh, a lot of it looks like bark. I had a piece, and it looked just like I was going to get a, uh, I had a piece of, uh, like, fur, and I found a piece of coal that looks just like it, but I couldn't find it again. But anyway, it, it's amazing because it's got the layers in it just like it. It looks like a piece of bark. And most of the coal looks like that. It has kind of layers and it's shiny and all that stuff. But uh, for all the coal, so coal, what it does is when it gets compacted like that, it, get, it gets hot. Just like if you mow your lawn and you put a pile of grass, pretty soon you can see steam coming out of it. Or if you go by some of the mills, the chip piles are all steaming in the winter. That's because they, they make heat. So if it's all buried and it's making all this heat and gas, 
What does the gas turn into? What do we call that? Natural gas. And the coal turns into coal or oil. So we have huge coal and oil deposits on this earth and natural gas everywhere. That tells me that at one time the earth was a lot different. It was really green. In fact, when we study Noah, we know that the earth was really green and that it had this water vapor barrier. In fact, it had a real high oxygen content. And I was, while I was doing this thing, I was, I was looking at, I stumbled across an article about a girl that fell in a well in uh, Texas. And they couldn't get her out for a day or something. And they finally got her out and she was all blue and, all, and they thought she was gonna die. No way she was gonna make it. Her blood didn't have any oxygen. She was almost dead. And so because she didn't have any oxygen, they put her in one of those uh, hyperbolic chambers or something. I think that's what it is. Anyway, and it, they put oxygen under pressure and put her in there. She healed up in a couple days, came right back. And uh, they found that uh, the oxygen like that can do a lot of stuff. And in fact, if you go, I grew up in Denver, we used to always laugh at the Californians that would come up because we, the coach would say, okay, we're gonna run, the, you know, I wanna see if somebody can beat this time. And they're always like, I can do that, you know. And they'd take off and we're all just running. They're going around and then, and then pretty soon they're just face planting the ground because they just can't do it. You can't get that much oxygen, you know. Your body feels like it can do it, but it just can't do it. And uh, anyway, uh, back to the coal, so, uh, he found this piece of coal under, underneath the, uh, in the water, and he remembered a coal thing that he'd seen, so he went back and took, or he had a picture of it. And this is in a coal seam, a chunk that looks like a piece of bark in the coal seam. I, I really think that it is, and the stuff that I've heard that they've found in coal seams and stuff is more like, uh, I mean, I've heard all kinds of stuff. I don't know how much of it's true. I'm not really going to say anything. I try to just say the stuff I'm sure about, but... Uh, the thing I want to talk about, too, is, you know, the astronauts, um, it was on another one that I was doing, but I was reading a lot about the astronauts, and they all say, they, there's a few of them that have comments about looking at the Earth. I, was, I tried to get one, but they all get a little, they use not good words. So I'm going to paraphrase here, but uh, basically they look at the Earth like that, and they are just amazed. One, one they're amazed that there's this rock in space it's 400 minus 400 degrees out in space and it's just flying around and it's beautiful i mean like you know that the caribbean there is just tropical and beautiful there's snow capped mountains it's it's a beautiful planet to be on and they look at it and then they think about all the stuff that's going on i mean all the politics and all the junk and you know kim jong un terrorizing his people and i mean just all that stuff and and they say what they want to do is come down and grab some of these guys or the politicians, drag them up to the moon and say, look at that. What are you doing? <laughs> you know? And if we would just get along. What, could you imagine if everybody did what the Bible said and just put the other person first? This would be, this place would be awesome. In fact, uh, I want to turn to one verse. If you'll uh, look in your Bibles there, it's Genesis uh, <clears throat> and it's five and six because I used to this is a verse that's kind of always bothered me a little bit it's one where God gets mad spanks everybody <laughs> so in, in uh, chapter six verse five it says and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Repented, he changed his mind. And it grieved him at his heart. If you lose a loved one, you grieve. What does that feel like? That's a, that's a heart hurt. So one of the things I did is I made my girls were little I made them bar they love animal you know they have all these horses and stuff so I made them little barns first barn was pretty cool and then as they go along I just keep they keep getting better and so then the grandkids come along so I made them barns and and now that they're bigger I made them a big barn it looks like they're little barns and but 
let's say, let's say that when I mean my granddaughters, they're barns. I'm all excited, you know, I mean, my daughters love the barns, they keep them as keepsakes and everything, and, and uh, so, but now the two granddaughters are there, they're playing, and the one looks over and sees that this one has more horses, so she goes over and smashes one of the horses and throws it down, goes back, and this one comes over and kicks in the stalls, and so this one goes over and smashes in some of the door, and they just start smashing in the barns, and then they start fighting. How would I feel? My heart would be broke. One of the problems, is, and so God's looking at this beautiful world that he made. And here's everybody in the world, and all they're doing is fighting and hurting one another. And it says it grieved him at his heart. It just broke his heart. The other thing is, we need to understand is, when it says every, uh, it's talking about they'd fallen so deep in sin that I believe they, he didn't think they were coming back. I, so I, I preach a lot in the jail and the uh, missions and stuff. And there's one gal there, and she had some stuff happen and uh, ended up in jail over some meth and stuff. And now she got out, and they took her kids away, and she's just angry. She cannot forgive. Unforgiveness is a sin. All sin hurts us, hurts other people. And uh, there's that, I heard it somewhere, some pastor said one time, it always... Uh, take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. All sin does that. And you can't, the other problem that I have, like with these guys in the jails and stuff, is they're always telling me, you need to make better choices. You need to realize when you're in sin, you can't make better choices. You have to get, you have to repent first. You know, the way to get out of sin is you hold one hand like this, slap the other one right there, fall on your knees and say, Lord, I'm an idiot. You know, I messed up. <laughs> and that's what fixes it. And uh, so, but if you try to fight through it, like unforgiveness. Um, unforgiveness is hard. In fact, to prove that sin controls you, some of you here have probably been that way, where you've, somebody has really wronged you, and you're unforgiving, and then you finally come to a time where you forgave them. When I've done that, it felt like a weight went off my shoulders. Before that, I could say I forgave him, but I couldn't say anything nice to him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that wasn't coming out of my mouth. And, but once you forgive him, you can even say nice things to him. You, and they, they can't hurt you anymore. It's just amazing. That's because sin controls you. Well, and this girl, so what she's doing is she holds up signs, my dad's of this and that and the other thing, and, and she's taking them to court, and she's trying to, you know, destroy their lives and it's like she's almost so the sin has got her so much that she can't even come to that first step of repentance where you need to say you know and it's funny because AA and everything that's the first step you got to admit you got a problem so you admit that unforgiveness is a sin you can't even hardly deal with it I in fact you can't and uh, and the only way to deal with it is to pray and say Lord Help me. It's the same way with, uh, you know, actually, I want to I go there real quick. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> because one of the things that happens is a lot of times we read the Bible, and we got to be careful, because we read the Bible as a bunch of commandments, and a lot of times he's saying, this is what you'll do if you love. What are the two greatest commandments? Love God and love your neighbor. You think you can love uh, God without, it says you can't love God without loving your neighbor. You think you can love your neighbor without loving God? I don't really know, to tell you the truth. I I do know that if people don't love God, what they do is if Mike does something to me, then what I'll do is I'll justify why I can say what I can say. And so, you know, they like to give all this money to you know, charity cases and all this stuff, but I don't, they don't love God. And I believe you have to love God first. And the difference is, well, you'll know if, if that's true, is if somebody's being a jerk to you, and then you say, Lord, I know that you love that guy anyway. 
He is being a total jerk. But help me, Lord, to love him too like you do. That's your loving God and your loving... But look here in verse uh, 44 of chapter 5. It says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. To despitefully use. I mean, it'd be like uh, if my brother and sister, if, if, let's say my sister was uh, there and, and I had to go somewhere. And uh, well, I'm going to move it around. She's the bad guy. So she's got to go somewhere. And she says, Mark, hey, will you do the dishes for me tonight? And I said, well, I don't want to do that. She goes, come on. Please, you're my best brother and all that. Okay, okay. And I finally say, okay, I'll do the dishes. And then she takes hers, throws her stuff on the floor and say, clean that up. That would be like, ugh. Well, when somebody despitefully uses you, that's what they're doing. They're just being jerks and mean to do that. But the example I just gave, what you would say is, Lord, that guy is a jerk. But help me, Lord, to love him like you do. But see, isn't that what it's saying here? It says, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. It isn't a command, something that you're supposed to do. Basically what he's saying is if you love other people, these are the things you will do. And so sometimes we get uh, the commands and stuff to, uh, I think a lot of this stuff is just stuff you'll do by nature. You understand? I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but uh, um, that's what love is. In fact, we'll do the last verse here. Go to uh, 1 John. Um, it's kind of cool. You know, the I don't, I don't hold much weight in the numbers in the Bible, but they do amaze me sometimes. And like John 3, there's a lot of with the 316s. Uh, it is amazing. So John 316, we all know that one. God so loved the world that he gave. And really that's what love is, right? Giving. And then 1 John 316 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. It's the word perceive me. So if your mom says, if you did something wrong and you come in, you're like, and she says, I perceive what you did. <laughs> Does that mean you're going to get away with it? <laughs> nope. She knows exactly what happened. Perceive means to totally understand or know. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Now, Jesus did die for us, but that's not what this verse says. It says that he laid down his life for us. Did Jesus ever do anything on this earth for himself? The only thing he kind of did was he prayed and said, Lord, uh, take this cup from me, right? But then he said, but not my will, but thine be done. So that's as close as I could get as something to him he did for himself. He took it, and so laying down your life for your brother is, I want to go do this, but uh, I'm going to go help him. If somebody call, and you know who they are, because if you call up at 2 in the morning and it's raining and cold outside, you say, hey, I'm stuck up on this logging road. Uh, I can't hear you. You know, or, but if they're a real friend, you don't even think about. It. It's like, okay, where are you exactly? You know, and uh, that's what that's what love is. You're putting down sleeping and rest and everything you're doing, and you're just going to go help somebody else. That's what love is, giving of yourself all the time, uh, laying down your own life. And it says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So one of the things you know when I look at this uh, this whole thing. I know that the flood, I, th I think it was a bigger disaster than we can even imagine. And when we look at stuff like uh, the Grand Canyon or something, we can't even really fathom what it took to make that or what was happening. And, but it did wipe everybody off the face of the earth except eight people. I also know that when that stuff happens, God protects his own. Amen. I don't know if you remember the Shunammite woman. This will be the last, but the Shunammite woman. So Elijah... He used to walk by all the time, and the Shunammite woman said, Hey, come on in here. I'll give you something to eat. So she came in, something to eat. And then uh, she says, You know, I'm gonna, he needs a place to stay. So she just made him a nice little, says he had a bed and a little uh, desk and stuff in there, and she made him dinner. You know, pull in here and, and, you know, rest for the night, and I'll fix you something to eat. He never asked her or anything. She just did it because he was the man of God. So then Elijah's like, oh, man, 
I wish I could do something for her. She's like, no, no, I'm good. I got everything I need. You know, God's taking care of me. And uh, then she heard that, uh, Elijah heard that she'd never had a kid. So he says, before next year, you'll have a kid. And she's like, well, don't tease me. You know, <laughs> that's what I've always wanted. And, and, you know, but it ain't happening. I'm, I'm getting old and stuff. Well, then she had a little boy. And uh, it was the apple over her eye. I mean, you know, and, but then when he was a teenager, he's out in the field with his dad, the Bible says, and he started to get a headache. And he fell down, and they took him in, and he laid in his mom's lap and died. And you think a lot of people will turn, why did God do that to me? God, what are you doing? You know, she's, she put the boy on the bed and ran to find Elijah. That's who was the man of God. It's like running to God when stuff like that happens. Well, Elijah heard it, and he came, and he healed the boy. And you, sometimes we say, well, why did God do all that stuff? You know, we, we don't understand. And at that moment, I'm sure she didn't understand why her boy just died. That's the worst thing that could happen in the world. Well, then it's a few chapters later, so it's a little bit of time. Um, the servant from Elijah comes to the lady and says, you know, there's going to be a famine in the land. You need to just pack, just leave. She left her farm, left everything that she had. And she was obviously well to do. She just left it and went to Egypt. Then they had a famine in the land. Then she came back. But she couldn't get her land back. But that night, the king was talking to Elijah's servant. He says, you know, I can't sleep. Uh, tell me a story about Elijah. So he's telling her, telling him about this uh, Shunammite woman and how her son died. Elijah made her have a, you know, gave her a son. And then the son died. And Elijah brought him back to life. He's like, wow, that's amazing. You know, I, I don't... Anyway, the next day they're there, if you're reading, I'm kind of really paraphrasing here, but uh, so the next day they get there, and she comes before the king because she can't get her land back. And she's like, you know, I've been gone seven years, but it was mine. And they said, it's too bad, so sad. And, uh, and the, the servant says, you know, uh, that's a shoe my woman, and that's her son that Elijah raised from the dead. And the king's like, Really? Give her her land back. And you know, all the money it made while she was gone, give her that too. And that's how God takes care of us. You know, a lot of times stuff happens in our life. We don't understand. He took care of Noah. We see Noah, that's happening. And even like right now, it seems like the world's just falling apart. You know, that song, uh, um, oh, where's the new, I, about holding the newborn baby uh, because he lives. Yeah, that song, she wrote that song when the depression was going, everything's falling apart. World War II is just starting. She's like, going to have this baby. She's pregnant. And she's like, what am I bringing this baby into? And then she wrote that song. I mean, it's amazing. But uh, anyway, I just want to encourage you tonight. When you look at some of this stuff in nature and, and look at the stuff that's happened, just know, I mean, we don't want to break God's heart. And we break God's heart when we have unforgiveness, when we don't love one another, you know, and all that stuff. It, I know, I don't get here much, so one more, one more quick thing. So uh, I use this one in the jail a lot. So if you were in a, in a grocery store, I, I want to talk to you about how love changes people. Because, uh, you know, like when you smile, it just makes other people smile. Love is kind of the same way. So if you're in a department store or a grocery store and... Uh, you're in a checkout, and let's say you got plenty of money, and the gal in front of you, her card doesn't work. She's a single mom, a bunch of kids crying. You'd probably say, probably everybody here would say, I'll, I'll pay for that. And then, you know, and you wouldn't even ask, if she said, how can I pay you back? You'd, Don't worry about it. But let's say there's a guy in the store, he's being a jerk, calling you names, pushing people around. You know, you want to punch him, and he's in front of you, and his card doesn't work. <laughs> yeah and so but you know what if you say you know what I got that he's like no I do it I got it just pay for it just don't really know that could change what, what do you I, I mean if I kind of put myself in that spot that would change my life if somebody was nice to me after I was a jerk you know real love of giving of yourself changes people it changes things it changes everything amen amen and we look at 
my thing is, I just don't want to break God's heart. Like when he destroyed the earth. And when you look at it, I mean, if he gets mad, you don't want to be around, right? No. But, uh, no, but I don't want to break his heart. And uh, one more. Because when I was a kid, I always did what my dad said. He never punished me. He never had any, I didn't have hardly any rules or anything. And uh, I was the firstborn. I got away with everything. I mean, not really even got away with, but I just wouldn't do anything against my dad. And I went running around with these guys. They're in jail now. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we did some really stupid things that night. And I was supposed to be home and have gas in the car and everything. And uh, really stupid things, and we stayed way too long. I was coming home, and we lived in Colorado Springs, and it's like a half hour away. And we're almost home, and I, oh, I didn't get gas. And he has to take my mom to work in the morning at 5. He said, whatever you do, make sure there's gas in the car. Well, no, no stations are open. So they're like, no problem. So we went and stole, uh, we cut this hose, and I don't want to tell you all the story. It was crazy, but we siphoned some gas out of some wreck cars. I thought that would be okay. And so, <clears throat> and then we're coming home and did a bunch of stuff and ran out, you know, just anyway, it was really stupid. And I remember I got home and I pulled in the driveway and I could see the lights were on already. And I pulled in the driveway and I got out and I went, and I was waiting by the door and I could hear him walk down the hall, down to my bedroom, under the covers and I'm acting like I'm sleeping. And a little bit later I hear this, doo, doo, doo. he opens the door and he goes, Mark, huh, you know, he's holding the hose. And he just kind of looked broken and he just shut the door and walked out. And man, I told those guys, you stay away from me. You know, I don't ever want to do that again. And, you know, I, so what I'm saying is, you know, we easily break God's heart. But if we just tell him, I'm sorry, he's like, it's good. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for just loving us so much, Lord. Now, I'm going to just let Pastor McKenzie do the invitation there. Your eyes closed. Genesis chapter 6. In verse 6, why don't you all stand, heads bowed, and eyes are closed. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart.